In this video, I will cover machine learning for image reconstruction, and we'll be reviewing conventional approaches, first of all, for PET and MR, then talking about the machine learning principle, and going on to look at a simple linear operator, a full matrix, then a convolution matrix, and then extending to convolutional neural networks and showing some examples. So looking at a conventional PET reconstruction, we'd have um, a radio radioactive distribution inside the field of view. I'm calling that a ground truth T here. And what's happening, of course, is we're getting back-to-back -back photon pairs, which are detected in a sinogram, we're calling that a measured data vector M. And then we're trying to estimate some representation of that ground truth. I'm calling that a vector X here. And we use a forward model, such as the X-ray um, transform or line integrals, radon transform, which is basically in this linear operator A, a system matrix or a system model that gives us a model of the mean data, which we need to get to agree with the measured data in some way. Uh, for PET, that's nearly always a Poisson log likelihood, which can be uh, expressed as an objective function, a, a discrepancy or distance measure between the forward model AX and the measured data M. And so this would be the kolbach liebler um, distance or divergence um, if we're dealing, dealing with Poisson log likelihood. And then uh, what we're doing is trying to find an X um, that will minimize the discrepancy between these two as defined by the objective function, and we're calling that X hat. And the whole point is we have some kind of optimization reconstruction algorithm uh, that will update X iteratively in order to fulfill that objective function. And um, often, though, um, the problem here is that the data are, of course, noisy, and so we're fitting X um, to a, a noisy data set, and that means we often get noisy reconstructions, and that's why we often need to introduce prior information to add on to this objective function as a penalty. So if this is a distance we're trying to minimize, then we add on this penalty term to impede solutions that are too noisy, where this agreement is too strong. And so this introduces our prior beliefs about how the reconstruction should look. Uh, the problem there, though, is that we need to choose relatively simplistic priors that are easy to deal with mathematically, such as quadratic uh, penalties. And then furthermore, we need to choose the regularization strength, um, this hyperparameter beta as well. So there are two key problems with conventional PET image reconstruction, and we'll see that machine learning can really help uh, resolve those. Looking quickly at MR reconstruction, it's a very similar framework. Uh, we just now have, a, for example, a T1 weighted image here for the MR, and then the system matrix is just the overall encoding matrix. You'd have coil sensitivity maps, Fourier encoding matrix, undersampling, you know, including the case space trajectory and so on. Here I'm showing the case for full case space uh, sampling, and we're just comparing that forward model with the actual measured data. Here it'd be a Gaussian log likelihood to give a kind of least squares objective. And again, we're optimizing through some kind of iterative approach. Now here, the typical problem is not so much noise in the data, but usually it's due to incomplete data where there'd be missing components in case space, um, in the measured data, and that often results in aliasing, uh, kind of folding kind of artifacts in the reconstructed image. And so again, there's a need to build in prior information, but this time really to overcome undersampling artifacts. But again, we're, we're struggling with how to choose um, the priors, and so we're limited with relative relatively simple options, or well, not so simple. For example, we'd have uh, compressed sensing approaches. We could have a total variation prior. Um, but we still want to choose uh, how, strong, how strongly we should impose that prior information. So this is where the machine learning approach comes in. Instead of trying to fit uh, uh, some kind of object representation, a reconstruction X to noisy data, instead of that, we're going to be estimating a mapping that will take us from our noisy data directly to a high quality reference, such as the ground truth for a simulation case, or some kind of high quality data. So that'd be full case space sampling in the case of MR, or a very high count acquisition in the case of PET data. So we're trying to find now this mapping F. In general, it's gonna be a non-linear mapping, but we'll start off with linear mappings that's gonna take us from a measured noisy data set, M1, or indeed case space data for MR, um, and the mapping is parameterized by theta, and it's going to take us from that data to that high-quality image. So we're trying to find parameters theta now for the mapping f that takes us from data uh, to something that's very close as measured by a distance measure. Often it's some kind of mean square error. Uh, it's called a loss function in the context of machine learning rather than an objective function. 
It's trying to map uh, from measured data through uh, F to uh, some very close uh, match to the ground truth T. So trying to find the theta that does that well, and we're calling that theta hat. And the whole point is that we have many such training uh, set pairs where we have lots of measured data and then lots of corresponding matched high quality ground truth references. And this is an example of, of course, of supervised uh, machine learning. And then the point is we can plug in a new um, never before seen uh, measured data set, a test data set, um, which should hopefully predict an X that would correspond well with what the ground truth would have been had we known it, because in general, of course, with test data, we don't know the ground truth and hence the need um, for a reconstruction method. And so, you know, this is um, basically accounting for noise or indeed um, undersampling implicitly, and it accounts for the system matrix if we have enough training data. But we'll be looking into various methods about how to define that mapping F. Uh, here it is again, then, so we've got a training set. Um, so in the PET case, we have uh, sinograms, if you like, on this axis, in this high-dimensional vector space, and then we've got uh, true distributions on this axis. Um, so sinograms here for PET, or case space for MR, and ground truth images, whichever the modality is, on this axis. And then we're just trying to find some mapping. Uh, here I've shown a linear case, um, so some mapping F, taking us from the measured data to some estimate of the ground truth. And it's going to minimize um, that discrepancy over here. I've got capital N training set uh, pairs. And of course, therefore, we can plug in some new measured data set and uh, apply it to this mapping, which will give us this nice prediction, hopefully, of the ground truth image. So imagine then that mapping was just uh, a matrix. I say just a matrix, it's actually going to be huge, of course, because often uh, we have a lot of measured data in PET, for example, and the ground truth images are often 3D. And so this case here for machine learning would only be realistic in a, in a 2D reconstruction. Um, but the point is we try and find uh, all the elements of this matrix um, that would, uh, that would you know, minimize uh, the discrepancy um, of the, of the mapped version with the ground truth, basically. And so this would be an example of what's called a fully connected layer in the context of neural networks. And that's why I've tried to show this uh, matrix vector mapping in a kind of uh, neural network type notation. Uh, effectively, this value here is just the scalar product of the vector along that row there with the column vector that is the input. And that gives us one element of the output. Now, of course, um, this single matrix, uh, this linear mapping, is indeed what, what is done for, for PET reconstruction if something as simple as filtered back projection is done. Um, but in fact, it would often be a cascade of linear mappings because what would happen is you would typically Fourier transform each row of the uh, measured sinogram data and then do a ramp filter in the Fourier domain, then do an inverse Fourier transform. So already that's uh, three linear operators there. And then we do a back projection. So yeah, that'd be four linear operators that we would do there just for PET filtered back projection. So we have a cascade of linear mappings and we could imagine having a cascade of, of these uh, matrices of various sizes that are required according to the inputs and input and output uh, dimensions. Uh, for MR, uh, again, we could still get away with a linear mapping. Um, it would just be something like the inverse discrete Fourier transform uh, if we've got fully sampled case based data. Um, although in practice, of course, that's going to be done with the inverse fast Fourier transform. And again, we're back in the situation of some kind of cascade of linear mappings. And so the cascading of linear mappings often actually makes problems far more straightforward uh, to deal with, or even faster, uh, certainly in the case of the fast Fourier transform, even though it's still linear, um, but it's a faster way of doing it rather than a full uh, DFT matrix, discrete Fourier transform matrix. Um, but the point of machine learning is we'd not only be kind of implicitly learning um, an operator or operators that are doing these kinds of tasks if we've given enough training data, but also be learning um, how best to compensate for noise in the case of uh, PET data or to compensate for, uh, for undersampling artifacts in the case of MR. Now, of course, with a linear mapping, there are going to be limitations as to what is possible here. Maybe something, something is certainly possible for noise reduction for PET. Um, but ultimately, we're going to need uh, to introduce some non-linearities here to build in more powerful uh, operations or operators that could be done. And also, of course, with machine learning um, and deep learning in particular, we're going to be cascading uh, 
uh, these mappings, having them in like a, a whole sequence, uh, kind of a deep uh, network that does a, a, a whole series of different nonlinear operations that are, where we're having parameters, of course, parameters that are learned, of course. Anyway, so this is a fully connected layer. And the point is also that for a 2D reconstruction, this is already immensely challenging if it's just a single matrix here. So I've made an estimate here about 100 million parameters are needed in that matrix F if we're going to go um, from, say, a 2D sinogram or 2D case space data uh, to um, a 2D reconstructed image. And that scales up um, you know, massively for 3D reconstruction, where I've estimated of the order of a trillion parameters for a 3D reconstruction. So you can see that's quite prohibitive. And that's why we're going to need to consider alternative options for these kind of direct mapping approaches. So as a, a simple start then, I'm just going to now, instead of considering a sinogram or case space, I'm going to consider a, a noisy image and uh, we're going to look for a mapping that's able to denoise that. So we're going to map from a noisy image to a ground truth image. So I'm going to do that just by a simple convolution and that would mean this matrix F um, is now a, a circulant matrix with a very limited number of parameters necessary. So for example, um, if this convolution matrix, often it can be called something like a convolutional layer, but we'll get to that later. Here it's only one kernel. Uh, a layer could often have many kernels. But anyway, this convolution operator, if it just had a three by three kernel, then of course it only needs nine uh, parameters to do an entire image to image uh, mapping. And obviously for this case here, this would be a square matrix. So don't be misled by the length of that input vector. Um, to try and visualize this a bit better, um, I've just included here, uh, I've just flattened the output, uh, the target ground truth here. So that's this kind of green uh, 2D image here, and I'm showing that as a, as a vector for the output here. And then the input is this kind of blue input uh, vector, where it's just a flattened version of that noisy image. And then the convolution kernel here, a 3x3 three three kernel, um, I'm just showing that um, as duplicated and shifted according along the rows of this matrix F. And so again, what's happening at the output here is that we're just doing a scalar product of each row um, with the input vector. I prefer to consider convolution with a column-based understanding, but I think for the purposes of machine learning and with these kinds of visualizations, uh, the row-based understanding of matrix vector multiplication is probably the, the, the best way of understanding it. So uh, let's look at an example of what happens if we do learn uh, one single kernel. Here I'm going to be learning uh, a five by five kernel that's going to try and take us from a noisy measured data set to a ground truth data set. Here this is low noise, mid noise, and then a case where we're trying to deal not with noise, but actually trying to deal with a blurring um, problem. So here are the results of machine learning a five by five kernel. And um, it's pretty much what you would expect, which is for the case of low noise, uh, the kernel that is learned is this some kind of uh, sort of spatial averaging and neighborhood averaging, which takes the neighbors here, averages them together to give um, an output um, pixel here. And so you can see that we do successfully uh, denoise that input image. And of course, the kernel has been trained such that that M, when convolved with the kernel, matches as best as possible with the ground truth T. So when we get to a noisy case here, a noisier case here, we see that as expected, uh, the kernel is now broader in order to achieve more spatial neighborhood averaging and deliver some output here. Um, and then the power of just one simple convolution kernel is such that we could even learn how to de-blur an image like this, where we've got this now 5x5 five five neighborhood, which includes negative values in order to actually do some kind of sharpening um, in the output here. And we can see that this output image has uh, nicely sharpened up in accordance with its best possible match with the ground truth. Uh, this was a, a mean square error loss function for machine learning of these individual kernels. So we see convolution can denoise, it can recover resolution. And of course, the big win is that it's far fewer parameters. You know, it's, it's a tiny number of parameters, just say nine or here, 25 parameters that do an entire image to image mapping rather than that colossal uh, fully connected layer. Um, so let's try and extend uh, what convolution can do a bit. So here I've got another example, a uh, simulated brain phantom image, and just showing what we can do if we had, say, a 7x7 kernel. 
So here I've just got a, a hot pixel in the middle and negatives around the outsides. This is going to do some kind of edge enhancement, which is what we see here. So that's uh, this kernel convolved with that, showing the convolution output. Um, then we could also threshold that, and then that would explicitly really show up those edges that maybe this kernel here, I'm just designing the kernels, but obviously what we'd be doing is learning the kernels according to the desired output, which you know, we've already seen an example of, but I'll show more examples in a moment. But um, so if we learned uh, this kernel, or rather design, designed it here, then we can see that what a kernel can do with thresholding is it can beautifully pick out what we're going to call a feature map. Um, if we change the kernel here, we could pick out vertical edges, um, threshold it, and we can get a nice vertical edge feature map. Or we could uh, convolve it with a kernel like this. And what that will do is with appropriate thresholding, it would pick out the presence, for example, of a large uh, tumor um, as shown in this example image. Um, so there we have three kernels giving rise, of course, to three different feature maps, in other words, convolution outputs, although I'm calling them feature maps because they're not just the convolution outputs, they've also had this thresholding applied as well, and that will deliver um, three output channels, which could then be put into another convolutional layer. And a convolutional layer um, is, is composed not only of a number of different kernels, but also a number of different biases. And it's those biases that are effectively giving rise um, to this thresholding process. So an example would be something like a ReLU function, which basically sets all the negatives here to zero and just lets the other values through. And that would be an example of ReLU, a rectified linear unit. Just think about it as setting negatives to zero and keeping everything else. Um, but that's why also this bias, um, this overall global offset is necessary because that can adjust where those negatives appear in the image and so decide which features to keep and which ones to eliminate. So learning the bias as a single scalar value here alongside the kernel is actually also uh, a very important part of the learning process for a convolutional layer. Um, so a depiction here is often seen. There are various notations. Uh, arrows are also quite useful for showing these operators. Here I'm just showing that we've got the output of a convolution with a 7x7 seven seven kernel and that there were three of them and then followed by a rectified linear unit activation function. So there are many choices of activation but ReLU is by far and away a, a popular choice especially used in CNNs. Um, and as alluded to before we can then cascade these, we can kind of uh, keep going deeper and deeper and deeper by doing more and more such uh, layers and we end up with what is called a convolutional neural network. And uh, just to show another small scale example, um, to try and show also how we get back to a single image, because that's important to understand, rather than three images that I showed earlier. So here I've got an example of three different uh, kernels. Now I'm explicitly saying that they're single channel kernels, and the reason they're single channel kernels is because I've only got a single image input. So here are the convolution outputs. I could do again that bias or thresholding process, which would give the feature maps shown here. Um, and then to get back to a single image, what we would do is convolve with a single kernel um, that has multiple channels, because the multiple channels uh, basically mean that we add together the convolution outputs here. So this single kernel um, is composed of these three channels. And because it's one kernel, it means that we just add together the outputs of the convolutions of each of these feature maps with um, the respective channel of the kernel. Add them all together and that gives us one single output. So here this is just a, a kind of a toy example that I'm showing. Uh, we'll get on to some real application examples of CNNs in a moment. But just to emphasize, this is a convolutional layer. In other words, a selection of kernels um, with, a, with a bias and activation. And then again, another convolutional layer here. And this one really is just to glue everything together at the very end, to take those feature maps uh, in a weighted fashion um, to, to, to deliver one single output channel, which is the output of the CNN. OK, so to finish then, I'll go through three rapid examples of using um, convolutional neural networks for post-reconstruction processing in the first instance. Um, in a later video, I'll get back to the, uh, the direct reconstruction and how we can do other methods for reconstruction. For now, we'll assume that we've got a reconstructed image that's going in 
to a CNN, so a post-reconstruction approach. So we could use them to improve uh, image quality in PET. We can go from low-dose PET scans to high-dose PET scans. Obviously, you could do that just by taking a single PET scan um, and then sort of uh, thinning the data into a, a low-stats scan and then keeping the high-stats data and then learning a mapping that takes you from the low to the high-stats for many different training example pairs, supervised learning. Um, also, though, you could do um, acceleration of image reconstruction, where you could do a very slow um, MR-guided PET reconstruction, for example, and just learn the mapping that takes you from the clinically provided reconstruction to that more sophisticated reconstruction. And that was done by Shrem et al. Um, in, in 2020 in a neuroimage paper. I'll show you a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, and in the context of MR, we could do, again, a kind of a a kind of a very fast basic uh, reconstruction and, and map that um, to, to a high quality, uh, longer processing time reconstruction. So starting off then with the low count to high count case, I think this is about a factor of seven uh, to 10 in, in data here. And what we're gonna do then is just estimate the parameters theta, theta hat for this mapping F, which is gonna be a convolutional neural network with three layers, uh, 32 kernels uh, per um, I, in fact, the number of kernels will be shown in the next slide, just to give you more detail on that. But it's basically made up of, of three layers with, with a number of kernels of different uh, sizes. And then we're going to use the mean square error loss, and this is about 40,000 parameters that are being learned to map from a low-dose image to a high-dose image. And so this is the example of a paper from Casper uh, de Costa Lewis uh, and myself, actually, uh, where what was used here were four... Uh, input channels where we had the low dose reconstruction uh, with resolution modeling included and the low dose reconstruction without resolution modeling included and then the T1 weighted MR and then a non-local means filtered version of the low dose uh, reconstruction. So these are four input channels which are then convolved uh, with 32 different kernels and um, so that delivers um, 32 channels here and again, you can do another convolution this time, um, another convolutional layer, but these now need to be 32 channel kernels to be able to pick up all of the 32 inputs here. And then uh, we finally do a convolution with one kernel uh, that again would need to have now uh, 32 channels in order to uh, glue together all of those feature maps in just the right way so as to deliver an output when all of these parameters of all the kernels are adapted um, should match uh, the high dose target. And here we can see that we've got um, a five by five uh, kernel um, in the first stage, three by three in the second stage, and then a simple one by one at the final stage where we're just sticking together the different feature maps. And so there were 32 kernels used in the first two layers and then just one kernel at the end. And so you can see basically that uh, it has delivered um, a good outcome. It hasn't perfectly matched the target, but the predicted high dose reconstruction is certainly uh, notably of improved image quality. And I refer you to the paper to go into detail, improved image quality compared to the low dose inputs. Okay, so a second example um, is, um, is the method of SRAM et al, where what we're trying to do now is take uh, the standard clinical OSEM reconstruction here, along with its uh, T1 weighted uh, image, presuming that's available, to be then supply as a, a two channel input to a CNN uh, where there are now eight layers and uh, there are 30 kernels of um, three by three by three size. So this is 3D now, a CNN, mean square error loss, um, 170,000 parameters trained up to map this standard clinical uh, reconstruction to a more time-consuming, sophisticated MRI-guided PET reconstruction. So it's like a MAP-EM reconstruction, which could take anything from minutes to hours um, to do, normally speaking. But of course, this uh, standard reconstruction is always available with every scan from the scanner. And so this mapping now, it just takes a matter of maybe a second if you're using a GPU or maybe a minute on a CPU. And even they've impressively trained this for multiple noise levels. And in fact, they can even do the, the increased dose uh, mapping here as well. They've uh, checked it for different traces and um, even, it seems, for different scanners. So that's a, a pretty robust example of a CNN. And I point you to the paper of Shram et al to go into more detail of that very nice work indeed. Uh, just to finish then with the example of MR reconstruction, 
uh, we could, of course, just go from undersampled fast reconstruction, such as shown here, where we've got aliasing artifacts, and then we just learn the mapping, this time via a CNN with four layers and 16 kernels of 3 by 3 by 3 size, um, and then again using a mean square error loss function to map that uh, low quality reconstruction with aliasing through to this uh, uh, version that would normally be computationally very intense to deliver, such as the GRASP reconstruction here. And again, transformative. So we've got a CNN delivering this kind of quality output in 74 seconds instead of you know, um, three and a half hours basically on, on a CPU. And so I'll refer you to the uh, reference shown at the bottom left of the slide there. So in summary then, uh, we've seen that conventional reconstruction in PET suffers from noise, and that noise is primarily due to low dose uh, imaging or short scan uh, timeframes and so on, limited scanner sensitivity, and so noise is nearly always the issue with PET. MRI, often the issue is the desire to run things more quickly, faster acquisition, and therefore aliasing artifacts will arise from that undersampling. Um, both of these um, modalities, um, the, the reconstruction issues, are resolved typically by regularization, but that regularization is going to need optimization. And so how do we do that? And that's where machine learning can begin to come in and answer that question. In this first video, I've just shown you some of the principles of machine learning, just showing entire linear mappings, uh, motivated by the idea that filter back projection is a linear mapping, the inverse Fourier transform is a linear mapping, and then also the idea that we can cascade those linear mappings and, um, and actually do quite powerful operations, um, including um, more generally the, the use of nonlinearities. It's when we start to do multiple convolutions with multiple kernels and build in nonlinearities, those activations with the relus as well as the, the bias as well. Uh, means that we can deliver quite powerful non-linear operations that can act on um, images and significantly upgrade them in a post-processing kind of way. But what we'll show, um, so that's why in this video I've shown the example of improving the quality of low-dose PET, improving um, MLEM uh, PET reconstructions or OSCM reconstructions and showing how we can deliver guided uh, high quality reconstructions and also showing the example we just looked at of undersampled MRI and mapping that to a better quality reconstruction. But where we'll be going next is showing how we can use machine learning methods to actually do the entire reconstruction. Obviously that's quite limited um, in terms of the computational intensity of that. But And then we'll also go on to look uh, at how we can practically do 3D reconstruction by taking existing iterative methods and implanting uh, machine learning or deep learning inside them. Thanks for listening.